Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome friends to this 13th lecture on the series on human behavior. Now the course uh, as I had explained in many previous lectures is looking at how to study human behavior. So the basic of human behavior or the study of human behavior can only be done through the science of psychology and so what I have done up till now the past 12 lectures is make you aware with the science of psychology the very basic concepts and the very bas basic methodologies which psychology uses to study human behavior. Now let me try to link all these uh, material that we have done up till now in the past 12 lectures into how does it actually help in studying human behavior. So, we will take a quick look back onto what we have done uh, up till now and we will introduce a new topic a very uh, interesting topic today which is again one of the basics of studying human behavior. So, we started off our discussion by looking at the basics of the science of psychology. Before we start using any science to study human behavior, we should know its basic, we should know its concepts. So, what I explain to you in terms of what is behavior is that behavior is a reaction and we had a good discussion in the first lecture of why we should, should be studying human behavior and what is human behavior for that matter. So, we started off by looking at the basics of the science of psychology. We started out defining uh, the historical roots of what psychology is, defining psychology in itself and uh, looking at the other schools of psychology, the various viewpoints of psychology which is used to study human behavior. Then at the end of this, we introduced to you some of the methodologies that we use in studying human behavior. So, uh, we introduced the idea of experimentation, the idea of correlation, the idea of uh, uh, observation and so many other ideas, the methodologies of study psychology. So, once we are equipped, once we are equipped with this science, we started into the journey of studying human behavior. Now, every behavior starts with a stimulus or starts with an event, an external event. Now, behaviors of course can also be generated because of in internal events, but since uh, the study of psychology mostly concerns with uh, external or, or a good way to study psychology is to look at external events. So, in the next set of lectures, we started looking at those apparatus, those processes and structures that humans have for encoding the physical stimulus, the physical world in the psychological realm. And there we uh, did some work on sensation, defining what sensation is, uh, the parameters of any sensory system, for example, sens uh, sensitivity and uh, sensory coding. Sensory coding is the process through which uh, sensory stimuluses are uh, encoded. Then we looked at uh, how human beings uh, detect signals from the uh, uh, noisy environment that, that, that is external to it and that is internal to it. So, two kind of noisy environments, external environment or the physical environment outside of human beings are always noisy and in fact, the human brain also creates a lot of noise. So, we looked at the idea of signal detection theory and after that we introduced uh, a model system which is the eye and looked at how this model system uh, functions in terms of sensory process. Now, once 
in understanding human behavior, once we have detected or once we have uh, witnessed an external event, this leads to us interpreting this uh, event in the psychological domain and that is where the idea of perception came in. And so, in perception, uh, we looked at how the perceptual process really functions. Now, perception is making meaning to what the sensory, sensory systems are delivering to us. And so, we looked at perceptual systems, uh, we looked at two viewpoints of the perceptual system, two models of the perceptual system and we further looked at the five stages of perception starting from attention to uh, localization to uh, recognition. Uh, then abstraction and constancies. These processes actually help you in making meaning of any external stimuluses uh, which are uh, coming to you to the sensory system. Once we know that a certain event has happened in the external environment and we are able to encode and make meaning out of it through the perceptual processes, we learn something from it, right. So, we, why do we learn or why do we uh, keep uh, the, these external stimuluses or this external information within us. So, that at a later point of time when we encounter these stimuluses or certain situations, we do not have to work over for generating the appropriate response. And so, for doing that a process which is called learning is, is required. And so, then we started look, looking at what is learning. So, we started off by defining uh, two basic forms of learning, the first form being the non-associative form and the other form being the associative form. So, we looked at simple learnings which is uh, learning like habituation and sensitization, reflex learning where one item or one event leads you to learning. Then we looked at the associative forms of learning which is uh, uh, associating many stimuluses or stimulus response and based on that acquiring knowledge. So, we looked at classical conditioning, we looked at instrumental conditioning and we looked at observation learning. So, this is basically uh, the different kind of uh, learning uh, that we that we looked at and the, that we did in the chapter on learning and conditioning. Now, once we have learned something, once we have gained knowledge from whatever perceptual interpretation the perceptual system has made and this knowledge has been learned or this knowledge has been acquired, they need to be stored somewhere and that is where we started dealing with the idea of memory. Memory is a system which act not only encodes information, but it stores and it also helps it us in re recalling this information at a later point of time to uh, decide which is the best response to a particular event, stimulus or situation. Memory then, we looked at the idea of memory from two influential viewpoints of that Kinchin Schrieffen and the neural network model. And there, we also focused on uh, the idea of what is long term memory, the what, what is working memory and how does long term memory and working memory, uh, they, they uh, talk to each other, what kind of information can be stored in working memory uh, and, and in the long term memory and what kind of uh, uh, memory systems are there. For example, we have the declarative and the procedural system, one system which we can access, the other system which we cannot access and so different kind of memories or different kind of stores uh, and, and, and different kind of information which is stored. And we also looked at several factors which decide how information will be stored, which information will be stored, how it will be forgotten, where it will be forgotten and that kind of thing. Now, once we store the information which is learned in our memory systems, in our uh, human brain, we need to exchange this system or exchange this information between people because one of the ways that is that's what uh, that is where we divided between memory and higher cognition. So, memory is a lower cognition process, it is sometimes considered a higher cognitive process. So, we, we separated uh, from there in our lecture series. So, we then we started looking at higher cognitive processes. So, once we have information within us in memory, we need to express this information or we need to communicate this information through our behavior. And so, one is non-verbal, the other is verbal. So, basically when two beings talk to uh, each other, uh, a person uh, behaves in a certain manner, uh, he, he communicates certain ideas. And so, we looked at the next section looks at what is communication and what is language. So, we focused on the idea of what is language and so, we focused on our written language, we, we focused on the difference between communication and language and then focused on the basic idea of the English language. So, what it, what it comprises of and that kind of a thing.
So, we looked at what is the, the basic speech sound uh, and then how these uh, form to uh, combine together to form the word and then from there the sentences and how it is communicated, sentences are communicated and, and uh, what how is meaning generated and whether language is innate or is it is it learned and can animals also learn language. So, that is that is what we did and further to that once we have language, this language actually represents information. So, how does this information uh, stored? Also, whenever we have some information within us or uh, processed by the brain, we need to act on this information and one of the ways in which we act is something called thinking. So, we then looked at something called thought process of what is thinking and so we looked at two basic type of thinking, uh, language of the mind or language of the thought, the propositional thought and the idea of the imaginal thought and that is what we did in the last lecture, we looked at what is propositional thought, what is imaginal thought, within the propositional thought we looked at what are concepts because concepts define propositional thoughts and what is the process of classification, then we looked at what is reasoning. So, uh, reasoning is how uh, we think, so thinking involves some kind of a reasoning. So, many arguments and a conclusion uh, when, when these come together and when we start thinking on them or we start reasoning why a certain event, we start giving reason to why certain events happen or, or, or we start thinking about when we should act in a certain way and when we should not act in a certain way, the very process of thinking uh, involves uh, reasoning. So, we looked at inductive reasoning and we looked at the idea of inductive reasoning. Then we moved on to the idea of imaginal thought, how ima uh, the not only the propositional thought, but the imaginal thought also helps us in thinking. And further to it, we looked at the idea of problem solving, because once we have language and once we have thought process, this thought process is employed or it is used to solve problems. What is problem? A problem is basically a situation which you cannot solve. So, human beings behave the, and, and they do not behave in a very mechanistic manner, they think before behaving. So, human uh, beings behave in certain manner and they learn that some behaviors will reward and some behaviors may not reward. But if a situation like, uh, like a previous situation occurs, but it is not similar to uh, the previous situation in, in, in some ways, human beings need to think and solve a problem into how we should be behaving in certain ways or what kind of behavior we will be showing to certain stimuli, whether in the, it is in the external world or the internal world and solve problems which, which the environment presents to us. So, this is what we did up till now. Another interesting thing that we are going to do today is something called intelligence. Now, this is a very important uh, psychological ability and it has been much talked about. So, before we start, let us look at what is intelligence and what we will do in today's lecture is I will try and, uh, and explain to you what is intelligence and look at some of the basic theories and maybe then afterwards what I will do is I will introduce to you how intelligence is measured and uh, take up a model system which is emotional intelligence and explain to you what it is all about. So, let us start with the story. When I used to go to school, I had a friend who was very intelligent and he used to beat me in everything. I used to call him super intelligent X, Y, Z, I will not name him because uh, there, is, there is no way to uh, or it is not good to name someone, right. And so, this person where, uh, who, who was working with me or who was in my class used to be brilliant, you know, be it academics, be it uh, sports, be it anything, he would beat me and I it would wonder, uh, wonder and I would wonder or friends of mine would wonder how is it that he is able to beat me in so many things look at anything, good in marks, good in sports, teacher's favorite, parents favorite and all kind of things. So, he is, he, is, he is good with everything, right. And I used to wonder always that this person would be uh, the best from my school and he, he would do good in life and, and some someday he will be the most intelligent person because we would, we would call him the brainiac or the uh, most intelligent person. So, intelligentia is what we would call him. Now, years had passed and so I, I started uh, doing what I did, I finished my uh, doctorate degree, uh, postdoctoral degree and then joined my job and years after, uh, like 3 or 4 summers before, I went to my hometown from where I belong and, and I uh, suddenly or, or, or out of some curiosity, I not even actually curiosity, I was doing some shopping. So, uh, I went into a mall. And in this mall, uh, I, I saw a shoe store, which was a very good shoe store and unfortunately, um, I, I liked a particular pair of shoes, so revealing that, right. So, I am not a shopper that way, uh, but 
then I like this pair of shoes and I decided that I will buy this pair of shoes. And so, I went into the shoe store and, and suddenly I saw the, uh, the shoe clerk and he vaguely seemed to be familiar to me. I didn't remember him after so many years, but he remembered me and he said, oh, you are so and so, I am so and so, we used to study. And it was like a shock to me. This is the same person I studied with. And so, here is he, what is he doing in a shoe shop? I always thought that he was so brilliant. He would go become a professor somewhere, maybe Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, no matter where. Very good in academics, very good in everything. And so, I thought that he would do good things in life. He would become very popular in life. And so, he was not doing anything. He was, he was uh, in a shoe store. Now, I quickly, when I talked to him, I quickly understood where the problem was. Although he was very intelligent, what was happening is the conversation that we were happening, is it was not stable. This person was jumping from one conversation to another per, uh, conversation, jumping between ideas, not comprehending thoughts, had its own mind, uh, had its own thought process and so he was not able to contemplate anything. He was not able to focus on anything. And so, when I took this shoe from the shop and I went out, I, I went out cursing myself, uh, uh, telling myself that, look, what has happened to intelligence? This person was the most intelligent person. And so, this story actually tells you what intelligence is all about. Intelligence is not something which guarantees you success and achievement in life. Intelligence is a property. So, by the definition of it or by the idea that you have intelligence, you, you, you do not get guaranteed that you will be a success. And so, many intelligent persons are known to be failures in their life. Look at Albert Einstein, look at uh, uh, Sigmund Freud, look at any person for that matter, they have been highly intelligent in life. Similar to this, there, there is a story of Theodore William, uh, Woodrow Wilson who had been the 28th pre president of the United States and he started off as being the most intelligent person in his town. And so, later on uh, he joined, uh, he uh, got very bad grades, he passed out somehow, he joined Princeton and from there he became what he became. So, uh, he became a very popular writer first and then um, uh, uh, won the election and within the World War I he, he uh, took America to its success. So, these are two stories basically actually tell you that intelligence is not something, a property uh, which is which you are born with first of all and then even if you are intelligent, it guarantees you no success in life. It, guarantee, it does not guarantee you that uh, you, you will be highly successful. So, let us look at the definition of what intelligence is and let us start the psychological interpretation. Now, how it is related to studying human behavior because one of the things in, in human behavior is always talked about, we have talked about is intelligence. So, let us look at what is intelligence and, and, and how to study intelligence and what role should we, uh, uh, should we think intelligence has in terms of defining human behavior. So, first let us start with the definition of what intelligence is and I, so I have some uh, very nice uh, frames here which will talk to you about intelligence. Let us look at this. Now, there is this, this small kid who actually gets a F in his uh, exam and he says that I blame it on intelligence failure. So, he says that see, uh, uh, it is not me who is failing, it is basically my intelligence. And so, what he means is that the, it comes out of heredity and so the father is stupid and so he is stupid and, and it is nothing to do with him. It is nothing to do with the fact that he actually did not study for the exam. Look at the other one. It is, it's, it's, uh, Calvin and Hobbes from Calvin and Hobbes and so if you, if you look at it, it is very interesting, it, say, it seems that so uh, Calvin says to Hobbes that sometimes I think the surest sign that intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe is that, is that none of it has ever tried to contact us and so this is another very funny way of looking at intelligence. So, basically he says that uh, we are unintelligent people and the very fact that they have not contacted us is shows intelligence and so there are several definitions of it. And then I will have a quote from Michael Nisha, uh, Frederick Nisha who says that the man of knowledge must be able not only to love his enemies, but also to hate his friends and that is what is intelligence, the definition of intelligence. So, let us quickly look at what intelligence is, the definition of what intelligence is all about. Now, it is said that intelligence like love is one of those concepts that are easier to be recognized than to define. Just like love is a feeling that you have, that, that you can 
feel that you that that you are aware of and that you can express but then you can never be sure of it similarly intelligence is a property that that you that you can be aware of that that you know that somebody processes but then you can never be sure about it and so there is no correct definition of intelligence there is no way to actually define what is intelligent and what is unintelligent which system is intelligent and which system is not intelligent and let's look at why is this problem coming so some reasons why intelligence cannot be easily defined is with certainty are so one of the reasons is that defining intelligence is difficult as there are many different definitions so what we'll do is we look at some of the definitions of intelligence so there have been a number of psychologists number of people who have defined intelligence in different ways for example uh, the earliest definition of intelligence comes from galton who actually used the idea of charles darwin and so he defined intelligence as a property which is possessed by people so some people are superior born superior and and he believed that doctors engineers uh, they come from families who are superior than other in, uh, than other other families who are an inferior so accountants and and clerks are not born in superior family and so when he did, did his testing and so he believed that intelligence is in in terms of uh, how much uh, the length of your head is or how much your perceptual ability is or how quickly visual acuity is how quickly your response time is and so he he believes that these are the definitions of intelligence but that that's stupid to look at and so when he did his work where he tested uh, in in a london conference around the uh, um Uh, around his time he he tested people some 1600 people uh, who were no who he believed to be intelligent and none of the factors that he had had any correlation or any kind of uh, 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 gave any kind of result similar to what he predicted so basically what he predicted was not true and so one reasons why intelligence is difficult to define is that there are many reasons of or many definitions of intelligence now the second definition or the second reason why intelligence cannot be defined is that some see intelligence as a label for what intelligence test measure so on one hand we have people defining different different ways in which intelligence is on the other hand some people believe that intelligence is what intelligence test measure but then you must be aware that there are there aren't intelligence tests which actually measures everything the whole intelligence of yours people might be intelligent in academics and so they may be stupid in some other field people might be intelligent in in uh, in social uh, uh, connection in, in social world and they might be uh, unintelligent in academics people will be highly creative so they will be intelligent in creativity and may be stupid in some other things and so there there are several definitions and so the idea that intelligence test is what is intelligent is wrong because there are different kind of intelligence tests you have an academic intelligence test you have a intelligence uh, test which measures your emotionality there are spiritual intelligence tests and so on and so forth so if what is intelligence is defined by intelligence test the definition is wrong and then some take a broader view that intelligence involves the ability to learn from experience think in abstract terms and deal effectively with one's environment and this is the most suitable view of intelligence and what it says is that intelligence involves the ability to learn from experience intelligent are those people who actually learn from the experience who actually have the ability to see where they have committed a mistake in the, in in their uh, past and learn from them and uh use something called observation learning so they observe their own behavior and see that which is not recorded or which is which is not rewarded and the one which is rewarded and selects the most optimal behavior for any event or situation similarly these people are also able to think in abstract terms these people can think in up can think uh, in abstract terms can think in abstract ways can create abstract uh, meanings they can tolerate uh, the idea of uncertainty right they can think in 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 terms of uh, in, in terms of things which don't exist and so uh, they 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 can they can do that kind of a thinking out of the box kind of a thinking and they can deal with effectively with one's environment and so one of the other things is that whenever an environment changes or some environment near them changes they are able to effectively deal with it so once you change an environment from one environment to another for example moving from school to college or moving from college to job when you need change this environments so or moving out of house to the school when you are doing all this then a change in environment is there and so how effectively can you deal with it is what is intelligence so let's look at a definition of intelligence then 
higher for the purpose of clarity and the definition of intelligence should be held as the term intelligence refers to. So, then we have the final definition of intelligence and what is it? Individuals ability to understand complex ideas. Intelligence is how quickly can you understand complex ideas? If I give you a complex idea or if I uh, give you a complex term, if I give you something uh, abstract, a little abstract, can you actually understand that? That is what is intelligence. So, can you, uh, uh, is it that only you understand simple ideas or deal with simple structures or can you actually understand complex ideas? Then to adapt effectively to environment how quickly or how effectively can you uh, deal with environment. For example, if you move uh, from, uh, 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 so let us say that I am travelling from, uh, 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 I am travelling by uh, flight and my fi flight gets delayed. Normally speaking, I, I uh, have a very nice office or a very nice home and so when I am travelling, I uh, get the chance of visiting an airport which has a lot of sound and I do not like too much sound. So, can I effectively deal with it? Is it that I will rush to a lounge and sit there in a lounge in a quiet place because I, I do not like too many people, I do not like too much sound and so my place is quiet. So, can I effectively deal with it is what is intelligence, can I effectively deal when, uh, when I move from one environment to the other environment. Also to learn from experience, how quickly can you learn from experience or can you learn from experience at all. So, whenever something has happened in the past or some, some event has happened, can you learn from it. So, let us say uh, any event ABC has happened and that has, uh, that has led to several responses right in the past. So, can I actually learn from it saying that response 1 was the one which, uh, uh, which gave me the maximum satisfaction and then that is the most optimal and not response 2 and 3 because as I said human beings give multiple responses to the same stimuli at different points of time. So, can I, can I learn to select the best possible response to a particular uh, stimuli. Also to engage in various forms of reasoning, can I reason? Another interesting thing in terms of intelligence is can I reason? Can I reason like why something has happened? Can I reason uh, why 2 plus 2 is 4 and uh, 4 power 4 is 16 and 4 into 4 is uh, also 16, 4 power 2 is always 16, right? So, when I, or example, uh, can I reason why harmonic mean and, and arithmetic mean are two different things or geometric mean and harmonic mean are two different things? Can I reason that? Can I reason uh, why something happens? Why the earth goes round or, or that kind of, these are very simple reasoning, but complex reasoning, can I do that? Can I reason why I, I do not get uh, the same treatment everywhere? Can I reason that? And that is that's another interesting thing to look at. And also to overcome obstacles by careful thought, can I? use thinking, propositional and imaginal thought to overcome obstacles. Can I design equations? Can I think of uh, uh, ways or, or uh, can I imagine uh, a whole situation in a certain way so that I can uh, move out of obstacles or, or not get into obstacles? So, if that, that is what I can do, then it is what is called intelligence and that is the most premier definition or the most apt definition which is given by NICER. So, once we are done with the definition of intelligence, let us move forward to the question that whether intelligence is a unitary or multifaceted. Now, there are two group of people, one group of people believe that intelligence is a unitary thing and uh, there is another group of people who believe that intelligence is a multifaceted thing. Intelligence is just one uh, property or one process and system is one group of people believe that and there are other group of people who actually believe that inter intelligence is a multiple uh, factor thing or a multiple property system or a, a, a system which has multiple processes into it. So, let us look at that first of all. So, there are the two ways, the single view that intelligence is a single process and a single system process is, is or a, a single process system rather is basically what is Spearman's view and Thurston believes on the other hand that uh, many system, many processes actually comp comprises the idea of what is intelligence. So, is it intelligence a unitary characteristics or dimensions along? which people vary. The idea is that whether intelligence is just one characteristic on which people vary or is it that there are multiple dimensions on which people vary. So, intelligence could be composed of multiple facts. For example, intelligence is not just word intelligence. Intelligence should be how quickly you speak, how quickly you read, how quickly you solve problems, how effectively you deal with environment. Is that what is intelligence or is intelligence is just one particular thing saying that if you are intelligent, you will be doing good, you are not intelligent, you will be doing bad. Is that doing good or bad in anything? Is that what is intelligence? And so, let us look at what these things actually say. 
So Sperwin 1927 believes that performance on any cognitive task depends on a primary general factor G and more or more specific factors relating to a particular task. Now, Spearman's findings stem from the fact that most intelligence tests, although measure different items, they have high correlation among themselves and this suggests the presence of a single primary factor. So, let us look at the single, the idea that intelligence is a single or unitary factor. And so, the idea of Spearman, what Spearman believes is there is a single factor which is called G and this is called the general intelligence. So, what Spearman believes is that this G or general intelligence is what is present in most people and people have to be compared on basis of this general intelligence. What is this general intelligence? This is something which is present in most people and the variation of this, the variation of this general intelligence or this system defines if we are stupid or we are intelligence. And so, he believes that intelligence is comprised of one uh, unitary system or one system which is called the general intelligence and maybe a couple of other systems which are called the subsidiary systems uh, which are specific factor. For example, this could be the verbal factor of intelligence. So, gen intelligence is general intelligence, uh, one factor and we could have a verbal factor and maybe a social factor. So, two more factors are there and these S1 and S2 comprise with G. So, intelligence is basically G plus S1 plus S2 or maybe just S1, right. Now, how does the idea come that intelligence is just one factor, one system and one process? Now, what Spearman did was he looked at the idea that most intelligence tests, if you take intelligence tests for several things, for example, take intelligence, academic intelligence test, then take creative intelligence test, then take intelligence test for performance, then take intelligence for a test for musical ability and take all these intelligence tests and if you see the correlation among all the items, you will find that they correlate among themselves very highly. So, uh, intelligence, many intelligence tests actually correlate among themselves very highly and so he says that this correlation that they are having among themselves because if there are different factors, if dif different intelligence tests measure different factors, then there should not be a correlation among themselves. But then since there is a correlation among themselves, then there has to be unitary factor, there has to be a common factor which is causing this high correlations and that is what he said is G. So, he says that G is that common factor which is the reason for high correlations among multiple intelligence tests. So, so, multiple intelligence tests, the high correlation among multiple intelligence tests represents that there is a G factor. So, that is what Spearman actually believe. And then there is the view of Thurston who believes that intelligence is not just one specific factor, it is multiple factors. So, intelligence I is S1 plus S2 plus S3 plus S4 where S1 could be my verbal intelligence, this could be my linguistic intelligence, this could be my intelligence in music or this could be intelligence in social skills and so on and so forth. And so that is the difference. So, Thurston idea and Spearman idea. Spearman believes that there is one intelligence factor which is called G and based on that people can be compared and then this G factor is what is responsible for or what is the reason for your intelligence and there might be other some common S1, S2 specific factors which lead to intelligence. On the other hand, there is someone called Thurston who believes that no it is not true. What happens is that there are multiple factors and these multiple factors actually lead to the idea of intelligence. So, intelligence is composed of separate abilities that operate more or less in independently and that is what is Thurston's view. Thurston believed that intelligence is abilities, intelligence is composed of several abilities that operate independent of each other. So, it could be S1 for example, for verbal, S2 for your social skill 
and so on and so forth, etc. So, different skills combined together to form your intelligence. Now, according to the multifaceted view, intelligence can, people can be high on some components of intelligence, but low on others. Now, if you look at the idea what Spearman said, if you are high on G factor, then you will be high on other factors because G is the one which is deciding our intelligence. But the multifaceted view has an interesting viewpoint. It says that it, it, is, it can be possible for people to be intelligent on some, some so for example, uh, uh, some abilities and low on other abilities. For example, look at academics. Now, if you look at academicians, they are very good at verbal skill, they are very good at arithmetic skill uh, and so on and so forth. But when it comes to social skill, they are very bad at, at that. Look at the case of Albert Einstein and so he was very bad at social skills, not a very good people or, or for that matter look at any academician, they are not very good, uh, good in social. So, very high on academic ac uh, ability somehow uh, predicts that you will be bad on social skills. And so, this, this is what is, uh, is feature which is tolerated by the multifaceted view and it believes that intelligence since it is composed of so many uh, parts or, or, or so many systems combined together, one can be high on one component and low on other component. Thurston 1939 suggests that intelligence is composed of seven distinct primary mental abilities like verbal meaning, number and space. And so, what Thurston says is as I, as I, as I told you that Thurston is one of the proponents of multiple intelligence theory. So, he, he believes that intelligence is composed of seven distinct primary types, one being uh, uh, the verbal meaning, the other being the number meaning and then space and so on and so forth. So, seven different abilities, they combine together to form the idea of what is intelligence. So, then let us start looking at some of the theories of intelligence. Now, one of the most primary theory of intelligence is called the Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence. And so, what Gardner said is that intelligence he believes or he is stuck with the idea that intelligence is basically a multifaceted view. Intelligence is a property which is composed of or intelligence is a system which is composed of multiple components or multiple processes. And so, what Thurston believes is that mental processes underlie intelligent behavior. Now, what he says is that intelligent behavior since it is defined by multiple uh, processes or multiple mental processes. So, these different processes actually signify different different components or different different uh, abilities. And so, these different different components or different different processes actually combine together to form intelligence. So, people can be good on one factor and people could be bad on one factor and that is tolerable or that is tolerable. So, he, he believes that there are seven distinct types of intelligence that are independent of each other and operate in separate modules of the brain. What Thurston believes is that the brain has seven different modules and people may have some of the modules or may not have all the modules and then people have seven distinct type of intelligence all these intelligence types are actually independent of each other, they are not dependent and they can be functioning as a separate module, a separate developed module. And so, what he says is that any person may have all of these modules or may not have uh, some of the modules, but one of the module has to be in most people. And so, he defines the seven modules in terms of linguistic intelligence. So, the first type of intelligence that Thurston defines is called the linguistic intelligence. And so, what is linguistic intelligence? What Thurston says is that linguistic intelligence is that part of intelligence or that type of intelligence which actually make you good in terms of verbal vocabulary. You are able to speak well, you are able to talk well, you are able to comprehend sentences well, you are able to write well, read well and that kind of a thing. So, very good in writing, very good in reading and so women generally are tend to be having very high linguistic abilities. So, how nicely can you write? Right. How good you are in your grammar? Can you write complete sentences? Can you write perfect sentences? Can you talk uh, effortlessly? Do, 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 do you uh, feel afraid while talking? Now, how fluent you are in your talking and so that comprises of the linguistic ability. Then there is something called the musical intelligence. People with musical intelligence can find music anywhere. You might have seen friends of yours where, where uh, they start drumming something, they start uh, drumming a board and, and creating music out of it. So, people who can hear music from any external environment or for any external thing or can see music in the world or can see music where it does not exist or are so musical that they can actually find music in the 
in in the environmental sounds these people have musical intelligence say so they are born with a very sharp ear and very sharp idea of what is music then there is a third type of intelligence which is called the logical and mathematical intelligence now these people are the same people who are very logical talk to them they will give you a reasoning for everything they talk with logic they are the same people if you if you talk to them or if you give them any any kind of explanation they will be returning arguments in terms of logic they use some kind of a logic and these are the same people who are very good in mathematics give them any number give them they can play with numbers they can represent anything in numbers they can manipulate numbers they can come up with equations and solve many problems using equations they can use logic to predict uh, uncertain environments they can do all kind of things with numbers and with arguments and premises and draw conclusions out of it and so very good in in terms of reasoning in in terms of providing arguments providing correct arguments or providing uh, arguments of why should something be there and why should not be something there and what kind of behavior is appropriate when and so on and so forth then people good in spatial intelligence you might have often seen people or friends of yours who actually never forget a space which basically means that take them anywhere in the city or in your town in any town and show them the town once they will never forget that town and these people are known to be very good in special intelligence what they do is they use something called the cognitive map and so what they do is store these spaces in the brain in such a way that it is easier for them to go back into space or they are very good with lefts and rights now most of us have actual problems when we talk about lefts and rights so sometimes we say left and we go right and when when we say right we go left so it's very difficult to understand space have you ever tried reading a map it's it's quite difficult it says you are here and then there is some definition or or when google gives you some kind of if you ever used maps google gives you some kind of a definition or some kind of an instruction so how good are you in following those instructions i do remember one of my recent journeys and i was in vienna and so it it actually google gave me some instructions turn right from a particular signal and go round about and what happened is i i actually followed its 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 path and a place that was very near to me very right next to me i took a very long distance from following google and and following incorrectly google i rather i would say to reach at the place whereas a friend of mine who was accompanying me uh, she could reach the place much faster than me because she was not she had a good spatial intelligence so for me it was very difficult because i had to go about around about and come to the place on the other hand a friend of mine who was traveling uh, she was very fast in 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 reaching the place because this idea of spatial intelligence the idea of spaces or the idea of how we make uh, uh, movements in spaces that is uh, what was good with her and so she had a good spatial intelligence similarly there is something called the body bodily and kinesthetic intelligence so this is the same thing where people are able to know what their body wants or how kinesthetic uh, or what kind of function can be done or how push you can what kind of push you can give to the body so sports person have very good body, body intelligence these people are aware of the fact that what can be achieved with their body what can be achieved or what can uh, how uh, they can pull to the body to the extreme so these are the same people who know their body well who know how uh, what to eat what kind of work to do how it to do be done and so on and so forth so with the body actions they are very good now interpersonal intrapersonal intelligence intrapersonal intelligence is whether you understand yourself so intrapersonal right interpersonal is when we actually can talk to other people or okay? how intelligent we are when talking to others but talking to the self how good you are in knowing yourself do you know who you are do you know can you read your uh, bodily symptoms can you read what your body is wanting can you read what your mind is saying so how good you are or how aware you are in knowing yourself and dealing with it and uh, taking care of yourself is what is intrapersonal intelligence how good you are in understanding yourself that comprises the intrapersonal intelligence and then there is something called the interpersonal intelligence as i have defined this is the ability to deal with other people how good you are in dealing with other people so if there is a friend of yours who is asking for your help how good you are in talking to him and deciding whether he needs help or not or or how good you are in understanding social situations and defining social situations and that kind of a thing so how you, good are you in doing these kind of things is what is the interpersonal intelligence 
So, these are the definition linguistic intelligence, this is the definition of linguistic intelligence, then musical intelligence, then logical and mathematical intelligence, then spatial intelligence, body kinesthetic intelligence, the ability to use all parts of the body to solve problems of fashion uh, products includes uh, for example, fashion which includes control over the finer and gross motor actions and the ability to manipulate external objects and then we have the interpersonal intelligence that is distinguished among one's own feeling and intentions and then there is interpersonal intelligence. So, there is a good idea to go through this table. The next class of intelligence or the next definition of intelligence comes from the idea of uh, the information processing theory. Now, we have dealt uh, with information processing theory and so what does information processing act, uh, theory actually say is that uh, there are stores and there are processes. So, these stores are where information is stored and there are processes active processes which actually move objects from one store to another. Also information processing theory suggests that there are three steps in information processing. The one step being encoding where information is encoded in a particular manner, then it is uh, uh, stored somewhere at a storing system and then it is retrieved. And these three processes combine together with the idea of, um, uh, how, of how information or what kind of information is stored and how they are moved from one store to another within the store. So, the idea that how information moves within the store and how information is encoded and retrieved, this is what is the basic of information processing theory. And so, Anderson's theory is actually an extension of what is the information processing theory. So, Anderson's theory of intelligence and cognitive development. What does Anderson believe? Paul Anderson believe what is intelligence? Now, what Anderson believes is that the differences in intelligence released from differences in the basic processing mechanism that implement thinking which in turn yields knowledge. So, basically what Anderson believes is and so why I am doing this or detailing this is that Anderson believes that intelligence is a two part process. There are two types of intelligence, two part intelligence. One is called intelligence through the basic processing mechanisms and the other is called module based intelligence. Now, this basic processing mechanism is composed of two different processes, the spatial process and the, the propositional process and within, within the module. And so, intelligence is what Anderson believes is intelligence is this part and this part is not generally called as intelligence. So, what Anderson believes is that intelligence is how easily or how fast can you take in an information and operate onto it, how quick you are in taking in information, understanding an information and operating with it. The basic processing mechanisms of understanding any problem, take it any uh, examination. For example, take the JEE or GMAT or SAT. The idea here is that it is a time mount test, it is a 3 hour test or the test that you will be taking after this uh, course. Now, this is a 3 hour test and so it depends upon how quickly you can actually see a question, not only see the question, relate it from where this which section or which chapter it is coming from and not only that can find out what are the possible options which have been given and then can recognize which of the answer is correct and which of the answer is not correct. Now, the problem with multiple choice questions is that there are four answers right? and all of these answers compete with each other. One good thing about multiple choice questions is that there is always a possibility of 25 percent chance that you are correct, but given the fact that you, if you do not have negative markings, there is always a 25 percent chance that you will be right because one of the answers is correct. Right? But the task here is to recognize, to find out which of the answers is correct because all of them are competing. If the, if the answers, questions have been made in, in a good way, all of the answers uh, uh, work is competing. So, your job in a test like a 3 hour test is basically dependent on the basic processing mechanism. How quickly can you see the question? 
not only how quickly can you see the question, can you find the relevant part of the question. A question may have so many things, right? But what is the relevant part? What is the part that is actually of use? Can you pick that out? Once you can pick that out, can, can you actually use that part and uh, find out an answer? Found out from where in the text this question is coming from and then find out all the possible answers and then be confident about what answers you have looked at. That is called the basic processing mechanism and that comprises of two things. Basic processing mechanism comprises of something called prepositional uh, system and the spatial system. In propositional systems, the systems actually look at what kind of logic has been given, what kind of arguments, what kind of statement has been given and can this statement be verified or not and that kind of problems. The other is spatial, so looking at spaces, looking at diagrams, looking at uh, certain uh, two, two, two or three, uh, three dimensional uh, areas, how quickly can you navigate from one place to another, how can quickly mentally you can navigate. Uh, so questions like if somebody starts from point A, goes 6 kilometer here to the left, 3 kilometer to the right, then turns around uh, uh, to the right, left and that kind of a thing and how far is it, that kind of questions are special quest questions. So can you actually mentally rotate yourself in certain ways, do special manipulations and come up with answers and so if you can then and if you can do that fast because it is 3 hours test. So the more faster you can solve problems like that, the better you are in, uh, in terms of basic processing mechanism and the better your intelligence is. In addition to this, what Anderson believes is there is something called module based intelligence and what is module based intelligence? There are certain type of intelligence, so given the fact that if most people are given enough time, they will be able to solve the question that you have solved. The reason being that they are not able to solve it time based, they are slow. Now certain kind of intelligence for example, intelligence in terms of emotionality, intelligence in terms of spirituality, how spiritually intelligent you are, how emotionally intelligent you are or uh, whether you are a uh, honest person, so honest and uh, honesty intelligence based on intelligence. These factors do, are not very fast, so honesty does not develop very fast and so for honesty to develop it requires some time and so these properties or these factors are uh, dependent on certain modules in the brain and it develops over a period of time. Honesty does not develop very quickly, if I give you a question and you solve it and you will not have, you will not be honest, but you would be very good and quick in terms of dealing with mathematical properties, but not in terms of honesty, not in terms of empathy and these kind of factors or emotionality or spirituality, these, these things are something which develop over a period of time and they have, they develop using something called module or they develop as a module and so most people have module based intelligence which is these, these kind of things for example spirituality or emotionality for that matter. All these factors are module dependent and they develop over a period of time. So intelligence according to Anderson is composed of this basic processing mechanism, but then there is another kind of intelligence which is called module based intelligence and people do not actually uh, work on that. So what uh, Anderson believes is that differences in intelligence between people results from differences in the basic processing mechanism that we were talking about that implements thinking which in turn yields to knowledge. So how quickly can you think, how quickly you can do uh, propositional manipulations and spatial manipulations and come up with the answer. Now what Anderson believes is that there are two different routes to knowledge. So knowledge is basically composed of two routes, the first involving the basic processing mechanisms which operate through specific processes to acquire knowledge. As I said the basic processing mechanisms uses both the propositional process, the propositional process as well as the spatial process. Now the second route involves the use of modules to acquire knowledge, as I said this is time dependent, develops with age and so uh, intelligence can also be module dependent which comes automatically if module has matured enough. So certain modules for example, uh, the idea that how uh, honest you are, the idea that how emotional you are or how, how spiritual you are, they develop with time and they mature with time and so people are not compared, generally people are not compared on that particular intelligence type. A third theory of intelligence is basically called Sternberg's theory of intelligence, it is called the triarchic theory and the theory has three sub theories, the idea that intelligence is not just the basic processing mechanism or whether it is just three systems come uh, interacting with each other, Sternberg believes that there are three types of intelligence or so three sub theories, for example, one is called the componential sub, sub type of intelligence which involves the ability to think critically and analytically. Can we think critically, can we solve problems quickly, 
can we read our own feedbacks? How quickly can we solve problems? How quickly can we read our own feedbacks? How quickly can we do certain jobs? For example, if we are planning dinner for people, let's say I invite some friends to, uh, to my home for dinner. Now for, for that purpose, for achieving this dinner, I have to uh, know certain facts and I have to calculate certain facts. So how good I am in calculation? How much food should I make? How much food do I believe somebody will eat? What should I order? What is the environment? Uh, so can I plan ahead in time? Can I plan of what kind of food I will be ordering? Can I do this kind of all this? And so that, that kind of thing is called Componential in, uh, Intelligence or sub theory where the abilities to think critically and analytically is the core of it. Then there is something called the experiential sub theory. The experiential sub theory emphasizes insights and the idea to formulate new ideas. Experiential th sub theory basically says that intelligence, some type of intelligence are experiential in nature. It comes with experience. For example, look at Einstein and Newton. These people had intelligence of the experiential type. With experience, the intelligence developed. Einstein was a clerk and so if he had no experience or if he had not involved in the kind of work that he was doing, he could not have been intelligent. Assuming that intelli uh, Einstein became a clerk all his life and never studied physics, would he have uh, gave a theory of relativity? So this kind of intelligence says that the more experience you have with a particular domain or a particular field or a particular science, the higher intelligent you would be and so this is called the experiential idea of intelligence. And then there is something called the contextual sub theory. The contextual sub theory says that certain kind of intelligence is dependent on the context. Now people high on these dimensions are intelligent in pra practical and adaptive sense. They, they are what many people call street, street smart and adapt to solve everyday problems. Let us say that you go in a train and so you lose your ticket. Now very high intelligent people, people who are very high intelligent or people who have done highly intelligent things, they will freeze. They do not know how to deal with no ticket situation. Now assuming that you do not want to spend too much money and you, the ticket is very expensive. So how to deal out with a situation like that, right? So highly intelligent people do not actually know, they are very stupid, they get caught and, and so how to come up with a situation like that? Or if you are in a, in a situation which requires your uh, ability to deal with people, to deal with social skills. So if you are very good in logical in, or mathematical intelligence or in verbal intelligence, you may never get out of the situation like this. So how to use people, how to manipulate people, how to manipulate situations and environments, how to adapt to the situation and environment and get out of a situation like this is what is called contextual intelligence. And some people have this intelligence which is called, which is called or which is being called as the street smart intelligence. And so it depends upon context, it depends upon what context it is you are coming from, what kind of um, uh, situation you have been coming from. and depending on the context can you actually change. So most highly developed is Componential sub theory which includes meta components of performance components and knowledge and equation based components. So let us look at the component of the triarchic theory. The triarchic theory says that there is something called Componential and sub theory where you how you think and act analytically is what it is. So the, it has certain meta components for example performance. Now as I said inviting someone for a dinner party. You have to think critically and analyze uh, uh, similarly to uh, do this party. And so the meta component is performance. How good you are in performing? How good performance do you have? So how, how good you are in, in doing things like acquiring in much needed information for cooking the dinner for everyone? The knowledge. How quickly can you store knowledge? How quickly can you store ideas about who can eat what and who cannot eat what and that kind of a thing? And then acquisition, where when you have this knowledge of somebody is veg, somebody is non-veg, how many people eat what and so can you can you do that? Can you do a feedback thing kind of a thing? Can you, can you monitor your performance? Can you change? So if enough food is there, can you uh, get dispersed of it? If less food is there, how do you take care of situations like that? And that is what is the Componential Theory and these are the meta components of it. Similarly, the Experiential Sub Theory has two components of novelty and automation. For example, in, in the experiential theory where experience makes you become intelligence, novelty is a good part. So how novel you are in your approach and how automatic you are to common day problems that will define your experiential intelligence because the more experience you are with a particular field or a particular uh, uh, field of research or a particular field of expertise, you will become the more automated you will become, simpler problems will become automatic and so your sol solutions will be novel whereas for common people they will be only attached to simple problems. Similarly, contextual sub theory has three parts adaptation, selection, and shaping. And now, contextual sub theory has uh, parts like how quickly you are able to adapt to situations. Not only that, how quickly are you selecting those situations or those contexts which actually are beneficial for you. So, it is rewarding for you and not. Uh, 
giving you any kind of problem and the third is shaping can you shape situations according to you so that you have maximum gain and minimum loss the fourth kind of theory is called the uh, Cattle's theory of fluid and crystallized intelligence and so this is a very simple theory. So, this theory is based on statistical technique of factor analysis. So, let us uh, first see what factor analysis is very simply. So, in factor analysis what we do is a lot of data is there. So, a lot of data is pulled together and so meaning is interpreted out of the, the, that data. So, how do we do that? What we actually do is that we find commonalities. So, if we have a thousand of data and we do not know how to interpret it, the best way is to find commonalities or correlations between them and factor analysis is basically a technique of finding how much data points correlate among uh, themselves. So, if a, a lot of data points correlate among themselves and form clear cut uh, groups, then these groups are called the factors and this is what is factor analysis. So, this theory is based on factor analysis. Now, Cattle 1963 concluded that there are two major clusters of mental abilities which is called the fluid and uh, crystallized intelligence. So, what uh, Cattle says is there are two types of intelligence, the fluid type and the crystallized type. Now, what is fluid intelligence? It refers largely to inherit uh, abilities and to think and reason in a sense. Uh, the hardware of a brain that determines the limits of our information processing. So, basically fluid intelligence that which is in it is largely inherited ability of thinking and reasoning and this is uh, this kind of ability is hardwired to our brain and it is also dependent on certain abilities. So, how quickly can you read will depend upon how your eyesight is or how nicely can you find things is dependent on, how, uh, on your ability to uh, see. Also, how quickly can you uh, hear something will depend upon your uh, the ability of hearing and so that kind of a thing. So, small children will not be able to process large complex uh, problems and so that is also dependent on uh, the brain ability. Now, in, in opposition to that there is something called crystallized intelligence which refers to the accumulated knowledge information we store over a uh, lifetime of experience plus the application of skills and knowledge. So, this is that intelligence or those factors, those kind of abilities that we actually learn through our experience. Now, the examples of it, the speed with which one can analyze information is an example of fluid intelligence and the breadth of one's vocabulary is crystallized intelligence. As you know, analysis of information is dependent on how developed your brain is, how basic areas of a brain has developed and vocabulary which is something that you learn when, when you start learning language is what is called the crystallized intelligence. And so, the last theory in this section is called the CC's biological theory. So, it is a very basic theory and what it says is that everyday intellectual performance cannot only be explained by IQs or biological notions of general intelligence. So, what it says is that CC says that intelligence is not only just general intelligence or biological factors, inherited factors uh, looking at intelligence, but the environment has a lot of role to play. So, rather than intellectual performance depends on interaction between multiple cognitive potentials with a rich well organized knowledge base. So, intelligence performance depends on interactions between cognitive potentials with well organized knowledge base. So, how no good knowledge you have, how much good knowledge you have and how much good potentials or abilities that you have good processing ability, visual processing ability with good knowledge base can actually be what is intelligence and this highlights the impact of environment on IQ. More the environmental risk child exposed to lower the IQ and so this theory says that the environment has a lot of role to play. So, not only your cognitive abilities, but the rich base that you have that will combine together to form your intelligence and this rich base actually comes from well, well organized uh, knowledge base actually comes from environment. So, if you are in a very promising environment, you will actually turn out to be very good and if you are in a very deprived environment, you will actually turn out to be a stupid person or maybe not so intelligent person. So, I will stop my lecture here today and we will try and do a review of what we did in this today's lecture. So, what we did in today's lecture is we looked at another interesting factor which is called intelligence a cognitive factor which is called intelligence and that decides our behaviors to external stimuli or external world. Now, we looked at what is the definition of intelligence and how intelligence is, is uh, uh, basically uh, looked at as a unitary system as a multifaceted system how they combine together. So, that is what we uh, did. Other than that, we looked at certain theories of intelligence. So, starting with the idea of Gardner's theory to the idea of uh, uh, the Anderson's theory and Sternberg's theory and the idea of 
CC's theory and uh, Cattle's theory. So, we looked at five different intelligence uh, theories and how what they think of intelligence and what comprises of it and how it moves and that kind of a thing. So, how is intelligence important? What are the parts of intelligence factors affecting intelligence? That is what we did in today's lecture. So, when we meet next, we will be continuing with looking at how intelligence tests are defined or designed and what is the neural and the cognitive basis of intelligence. Further on, we will look at some intelligence tests and give you a viewpoint of what intelligence tests actually measured. And then we will take a model system which is emotional intelligence and see whether that model system fits with the idea of intelligence. So, up till we meet uh, the next time, it is bye from the studios of MOOCs, bye.